Faith can move mountains. Faith can accomplish great things. How many times have you heard this? And I wonder, do we really understand what great faith is? It was faith in God's power and providence that caused Caleb to say, yes, we can go into the promised land and we can take it. It enabled Job in the midst of disaster to say, though he slay me, yet will I hope or trust him. It was faith that helped Sedrach, Meshach and Abednego to stand on the edge of fiery furnace and say, the God we serve is able to save us from it and he will rescue us. It was faith that helped Daniel. And when we read Hebrews 11, uh, Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Moses and many, many, many others. It was faith, the power of faith. And our text is talking about faith. Faith moves mountains. Faith can do impossible things. And Jesus, he's preparing his disciples for the ministry. And he wants them to learn the most important lesson in their life. Faith. Faith has changed the life of the disciples. And if we allow God, faith will change our life too. Matthew chapter 17, verse 14. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. So they came down, there was crowd, the scribes were there, the law expert, nine disciples, they didn't go with Jesus to the Mount of Transfiguration, the father of this uh, boy that we, are, we read, uh, they were all there. They were all waiting for Jesus. And we are going to notice that there are 4.4 elements in this narrative. First one is the pleading of the Father. He knelt before Jesus. He showed the reverence and humility. And he says, Lord. He shows respect. He believes that Jesus could heal his boy. Verse 15, first part. Lord, have mercy on my son. He is begging. He asking for mercy, which, which is compassion. Asking for healing. And this father, he is in agony. He's pleading for his son. Second half of verse 15. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. He is, I guess, epileptic. epileptic. He is suffering mildly. Is that what we read? He is suffering greatly. It's not mild case. It's a serious, major case. Mark adds, that he could not speak and he could not hear so he is deaf and dumb and that he falls into either fire or water frequently so when he has these seizures he is exposed to great danger because around him there were open fires and pools of water and on the top of that there is a demon mark as in him and throws him to the ground uh, and to make it even worse. Could it be even worse? Mark says the demon was an unclean demon. I wonder, are there any demons that are clean demons? But he says, you know, this demon is unclean. So Mark is trying to tell us something. Maybe he's trying to tell us that the demon is forcing this boy to say some profanities uh, or maybe to act in an immoral way. 
we don't know, we can only guess. And then Jesus in Mark asks, how long has he been like this? <coughs> and the father says, from his childhood. Now you understand why this father is pleading. This is hard for him. And look at that this is his only son. So, he is the only beloved son of this father and he is going to face the only beloved son of God. And then next point is the disciples, they were powerless. They could not heal the boy. Verse 16. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Uh, is this strange to you? That the disciples couldn't do this? Well, uh, after Jesus resurrected him, you know, they were able to do this. But were they able to do this before this event? Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them what? Authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. He gave them authority and he gave them power to do it. And they could not do it this time. And they were already doing it before. Mark chapter 6, verse 13. Mark chapter 6, verse 13. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. So this has happened before this before our story. So they already draw out and says many demons. Many demons. And now they cannot do it. What has gone wrong? Have they lost power, authority to do it? And then the third step in our story, the perversion of the faithless. This is the time when Jesus is going to teach them the lesson. The disciples are confused, the father is upset and he is grieving, and then we read verse 17, Matthew 17, verse 17, the first and second part. O oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Jesus is frustrated and he is saying, by now you should learn it, you should know it, you should have great faith so that you should be able to heal and cast out demons. When he's saying, you perverse generation, Jesus is speaking generally, but I believe that particularly he's talking about the disciples. Because there were the scribes there and they didn't believe in Jesus. Uh, the father, he says, I believe, but help my unbelief. But the disciples, they should know better. They got authority, they got power to do it, and they couldn't do it. They didn't believe in God. And they, and Jesus says, you were perverted, uh, meaning twisted, distorted. Your faith is not as it should be. No wonder that Jesus is frustrated because by now they should learn the lesson they should have great faith and you know over and over they fail to learn it 
they failed to exercise the faith that they needed to heal this boy. Although they had the promise and they had the power. And then last part of verse 17, Jesus says, bring the boy here to me. And the father brought the boy. Mark chapter 9, parallel passage. Mark chapter 9, verse 20. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. The demon knew where he was. The demon knew Jesus. And you remember in Acts 19.15, when demon said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Matthew 17, verse 18. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. This was going for years, and suddenly, quickly, ended. Jesus healed him. He rebuked the demon, and he left him, and child could speak, and hear, and no seizure. Child was healed. Amazing. Jesus had this power all the time. And he cast out demons many times. Luke 9, 43, parallel passage says, and they were all amazed at the greatness of God. And now we come to the main point of this story. The power of faith. Now it's time for Jesus to teach the disciples. Okay, you can now just relax. There is no, uh, there is nothing that you can learn from this story. No. This is the moment when we need to concentrate even more. What can we learn from this story? Matthew 17, verse 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? You know, you just came down and snap, gone. And we just couldn't do it. And it doesn't make sense because in chapter 10, we read verse 1, you gave us authority and power and we were able to do this. We read in Mark chapter, I think, 6. Uh, it doesn't make sense, they are saying. They didn't ask, how could you do this? They knew how he could do it. But the question was, why now we couldn't do it when we were able to do it before? Verse 20, he replied, Because you have so little faith, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So Jesus tells them, you have no faith. Is this what he told them? He said, you have no faith. Is this what he told them? He said, you have little faith. This is their problem. Little faith. Little faith. Do you remember anywhere else in the Bible before this instance when Jesus told them that they have little faith? Four times Jesus tells them that they have little faith. Oh, you of little faith is the, the phrase that is used four times. Jesus tells them this. What is Jesus trying to tell them? So, uh, we don't have it in the Bible, but we can guess. When they saw the boy, uh, they attempted to heal him. And maybe they say, 
in the name of the Jesus, get out, or be gone, or something like this. We can only guess what they said. And nothing happened. And then the second time, maybe, they said, you know, in the name of the Jesus, leave this boy. And nothing happened. And maybe third time, we don't know exactly. But at some point, they gave up. They said, oh, this is too difficult. This is impossible to do. And they gave up. Their faith ran out. They quit. And in the case that you think that uh, this is unusual, let me take you for a little trip to see that this was their routine behavior. Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? They were okay with what they had. Their problem was with what they didn't have that were in them. They had a lack of faith in God that He will su supply them with what they did not see, did not have in their hands. And you might say, oh, I believe that God is providing me. And all what you need to do is go to your fridge and open it, go to your cupboard and open it, or go to a shop and buy food and God and you believe that God provides for you and this is where the disciples were but as soon as they heard from Jesus follow me and don't worry about food don't worry about the roof over your head God will take care of that oh they had problem believing that because they didn't have a job they didn't have where to sleep. How is God going to do that? And that is the problem. We have faith in what we see, in what we have in our hand. We don't have faith in what we don't see. You have a problem, you don't see the solution, and you don't have faith about that. And Jesus calls this a little faith. Yes, you believe that God can do miracles, but when problem hits you, you run out of faith. You have a little faith. Matthew chapter 8, this is the second time when Jesus is using the same phrase. Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 26. 23 to 26. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came upon on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. This is the second time when Jesus is doing or, and saying the same things. They could believe that Jesus could take care of them as long as there were no waves and no storms, no problems. But as soon as it came, they couldn't believe that Jesus could save them. Because they could not see a human way out. They had a little faith. And we frequently fall into this category. Oh, I trust the Lord, I trust Jesus. Uh, but when storms come, when problems come, we have so little faith. 
When faith stops, despair begins. When faith stops, worry begins. When faith stops, doubts begin. Matthew chapter 14, a third instance. Matthew chapter 14, verse 31. <coughs> Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him, this is Peter, you of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? So Peter was in the boat and he believed that he could walk toward Jesus because he did not see the storm. But when he realized that he is outside and there is a storm, Immediately he starts sinking. Verses 30 and 31. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Wind was already there, but somehow he didn't see it. Peter could believe God until there was a problem. Until there was a wind. Until there was a storm. And how frequently we are like that. Yes, God can do miracles until we face the problem. And then uh, the fourth time Jesus is going to repeat the phrase, O oh, you of little faith. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 8. Aware of their discussion, they were discussing that they forgot to take bread. Uh, Jesus asked, You of little faith, why are you talking among yourself, yourself about having no bread? You of little faith. When problems start, you don't have faith. Your faith, pardon me, you have so little faith. Little faith is when we believe in uh, what is in our hand. I mean, we can already see the solution, we know the solution. That's what Jesus calls little faith. But little faith cannot believe when, humanly speaking, there is no solution. You don't see how God is going to resolve it. Great faith is, although you don't see the solution, you trust, you have faith in God. Great faith believes in the middle of the storm. It believes when there is nothing in your fridge or in your cupboard. It believes when you don't have clothes. It believes. This is great faith. Little faith is when you already see it in your hand. And all God provides. That's little faith. Most of us, we only have little faith. Last time when I was preaching, and uh, I have invited you to join me to spend one hour in studying the Bible and Christian literature and praying and to pray that by the end of the year we will have around you know 50 people attending. What is little faith? While I was going through this sermon I was uh, sort of, uh, God has pointed to me and said, when you pray for 50, you have little faith. You don't really believe that's going to happen. So, maybe you're not like me. In last approximately month, when you were praying for us to reach 50, maybe you had great faith, not doubting, but believing. Because, has anything changed? We are still around 35. And are we going to believe in this 
when we see it? Or we are going to believe and pray for 50, although we don't see it? You see the difference between little and great faith? In all these three or four instances, Jesus was present with them and he took care of them and, and, and did what they couldn't do it. But in chapter 17, this time, he was not with them. And they were on their own. It was a new test. Jesus was starting to cut the cord. You need to grow. You need to mature. You need to grow your faith. I'm not going to be with you much longer. So he is trying to teach them that uh, one very important lesson that everything they want or need is not necessarily is going to be answered the first time you ask. Sometimes you need to pray and pray and pray and years are going to pass by and you need to continue to pray until your prayer is going to be answered. So, when you were little in faith, young in faith, things were answered. But now, I didn't answer because you need to grow in faith. And what did they do? The Bible doesn't go into details. But they pray maybe once, twice, three times, few times, and they stopped. Uh, it's too difficult to do it. The little faith does not persist in prayer. And uh, during the children's story, I share with you about a young Christian when she prayed for her tithes and when she had problem with a little oil at her grandpa's house. God quickly solved her problem. And when she was sharing this story with us, some, I don't know how many years later, and she was saying, but these days God is not answering that quickly. Why is that? The reason is because for her and for us. God wants us to grow in faith. And when the prayer is not answered the first time, or the second time, or hundred and first time, we are still going to pray and we are still going to believe. How many times we say, oh, I have prayed twice or three times. Or I have prayed for two months for somebody to get converted and nothing. The Lord is trying to grow your faith. He's trying to grow our faith. And sometimes He is not going to answer immediately. Just to see where is our faith. Do we trust Him when we don't have in our hand? Do we trust Him? When we pray and pray and pray and nothing happens? Do we have little faith? Or we have growing faith? Matthew 17 verse 20. He replied, Because you have so little faith, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. You read this and you say, wait a minute. You just said you couldn't solve this problem because you have a little faith. And now you are saying is if you had a little faith, you could cast out demons. No, this is not what Jesus is saying. The principle behind the master seed 
is not that it is little. The principle behind master C is it is little and it grows. So he is not saying uh, because you have a little faith, or if you had a little faith you could do it, but before he said because you had a little faith you couldn't. No, he is saying is if you had a little faith that is going to grow and grow and grow and become great, you could do it. That's the point. But we, instead of to grow in our faith, what do we do? We stay with our little faith. They started, the disciples, with a little faith. And Jesus wanted them to grow. And four times he told them, Oh, you of little faith. And by now, this is very close to Jesus' death and resurrection. By now, after around three years, or a little bit over three years, he expected them to have, to grow in faith. And they didn't. And to grow in faith, we need to persist in prayer and to believe. And if we lack faith, we should say, Lord, help my unbelief. Help me to grow. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, verses 5 to 8. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, let me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Uh, then the one inside answers, Don't bother me, the door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Verse 8, I tell you, though he will not get up, and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness he will get up and give him as much as he needs. What is this guy doing? Please, 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 please give me bread, please, please, and he says, okay, and he will give it to him because he is persistent. Verse 13, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Jesus wants us to persist in prayer. If you just said, God, I need this, snap, He answered that, you think you will grow in faith? No, you will not grow in faith. So he wants us to persist and persist and to persist and believe. And if you lack faith, ask for faith, but to persist. Matthew 17, verses 20 and 21. He replied, because you have so little faith, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Uh, yes, 20, 21. Jesus is not talking about uh, literal mountains. He is talking about difficulties in our life. So if you have problem in your life, and you have Faith like a small seed of mustard seed you know, that will grow. Nothing will be impossible. God will answer your prayer. Word nothing. How should we understand word nothing? Like, you know, nothing. No. It doesn't mean nothing. It doesn't mean, if I really pray that that physical mountain moves, God is going to move the mountain. 
we need to put this in the context of the whole Bible, of his promises, of his will. So in that context, nothing will be impossible. God says, I want you to grow in your faith. I want you to learn to trust me. And what I have to do is, I need to let you out a little bit at a time. And I need not immediately to answer your prayer so that you will grow in your faith. What the disciples should do after they prayed first, second, third, fourth times, I don't know how many times they prayed, they should continue praying and continue trusting and continue believing until God would answer their prayer. Or until God would say, like to Paul, don't ask me anymore about this. And he was asking to be healed. This is not, you know, we, we should... We should persist in prayer not because, you know, uh, we need to twist God's hand and to uh, force Him and He's going to say, okay, you know, I don't want to hear you praying anymore, I'm going to answer your prayer. No, 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 it's not about that. It's about us growing in faith. You have heard about uh, George Muller from uh, Bristol and there are a number of stories um, uh, but just to remind you, they, he was praying for five of his friends, close friends. After five verse, uh, years, somebody accepted Christ. After 10 years, two more accepted Christ. After 25 years, the fourth person accepted Christ. And he, for the fifth time, he prayed until he died. And he didn't see his friend accepting Jesus. But a few months after he died, the fifth one accepted Jesus. He was praying for a few decades for the last friend. This is persistence in prayer. And uh, there are some other stories like uh, uh, about George Muller. Uh, they would gather for a breakfast or, an, or, or, or another meal and no food on the table. And they would say, Dear Lord, thank you for the food that you are going to provide for us. No food on the table. No food in the fridge. Well, they didn't have fridges, I guess, at that time. No food in the cupboard. But thank you for the food that you are going to provide. And then, number of times there would be knocking and somebody would bring some food a milkman a, a, a baker would say oh this is what was left but this wasn't just once and uh, why I can mention last night that I'm doing a, a prayer walking because I have learned that you know if I am at home Two minutes is too long to pray. But when I am walking, half an hour is okay. You know, I can pray. Uh, and uh, what I am doing is, Lord, could you please help me, my family, this person, that person, church, you know. And I am only asking, give me, give me, do this, do that. And I have decided I'm going to change that. From now on, I'm going to thank God for answering my prayers. Because when we change our attitude, that is going to impact us. Thank you for healing that person. Thank you for answering that prayer. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing that. Instead of just asking and asking and asking. And I would like you to do the same. To change instead of just asking, thanking God that He is going to answer your prayer. Because Jesus wants you 
He wants us to grow in faith. Not to stay with little faith, but to grow in faith. God has given us tons of promises in the Bible. Promise for the wisdom. Promise to meet all our needs for comfort, peace, joy, virtue, strength, safety, protection, deliverance, promise of guidance, promise of forgiveness, promise of freedom. Promise, promise, promise. And He has given us the power of the Holy Spirit. And yet, so frequently, we do not experience the fulfillment of these promises. Because we have a little faith. Because we do not persist in prayer. We very quickly give up. Claim the promises. Use the power of the Holy Spirit that God has given to you. The antidote, uh, the, the antidote of little faith is persistent prayer. Dedicated, passionate, continuous, persistent prayer. So never give up. Never doubt. Never stop believing. Never stop praying. Have a great faith. And grow your faith. Amen. Amen. Well, that should refocus our faith. Yeah. Thank you, Rudy. Shall we all stand and sing the last closing hymn? Faith is the victory.
about the disciples and uh, their lack of faith or little faith and uh, we can see ourselves in them we have little faith so frequently we believe that you can do miracles you can do things but when problems hit us we don't show great faith we are like the disciples please help us to grow in our faith please help us to persist in our prayers and please help us that we thank you before things happen we pray in jesus name amen, amen. amen.